um, screen share. Okay. Okay, IP addresses. And uh, I'm sure that you all know what IP addresses are, but maybe I'll say a few things here that you uh, never really thought about and maybe didn't know. And uh, so let me begin. The uh, IP addresses that people used uh, until uh, recently, they used uh, IP version 4, as it's called, IPv4. And um, so IPv4 are 32-bit addresses. You see that right here, okay. IP version 4 are 32-bit addresses. And uh, from the very... Uh, uh, almost the very beginning of the internet, people started using IP. They were using IPv4, these 32-bit addresses, and uh, there were you know, several billion um, of these 32-bit addresses. You can figure out exactly how many. Uh, you would have two to the 32, and uh, so you can put that into your calculator and figure out what it is. I mean, two to the 10 is about a thousand, right? And uh, so two to the 32 would be roughly two to the 10 cubed. So you can see we're getting into billions of addresses. And um, so uh, at the time, that seemed like more than enough. I mean, when will we ever use up billions of IP addresses? Well, it didn't take long because almost everything anymore seems like it's connected to the internet. And uh, so we started running out of these uh, uh, IP addresses. And so I want to talk a little bit about how IP version 4 works and how it was set up. And um, uh, and then uh, I'm going to show you what IP version 6 is, which is uh, now also currently being used uh, in parallel with IP version 4. And uh, I believe um, IP version 6, well, I'll show you what that is, and there are um, there are unbelievably large number of I, IP version 6 addresses, I think. There are more possible IP version 6 addresses than there are electrons in the universe. And uh, so, okay, first, IP version 4. And uh, IP version 4, uh, the numbers that we get and that you've seen over and over again many times sort of look like this right here. Uh, here's an example of an IP version 4 address right here, this thing right here. And um, see, we have actually four numbers. There's 151, there's 2, there's 208, and there's 128. And each one of those numbers uh, is represented um, by 8 bits. So the largest that that number can be is 2 to the 8 or 2 uh, or 255 because the 8 bits go from 0 to 255 in decimals. So uh, the largest this number could be here is 255, 255, 255, and so on. And um, so from your internet service provider, they will assign you an IP address. And the internet service provider is given a block of IP addresses by, um, there's, a, there's a body which is designated to assign IP addresses for Asia and the Pacific. And there's another body that assigns them to, for Europe and another one 
for the United States and another one for Africa and so on. And um, so there's a, a body that will responsible for Asia and it will give your internet service provider a block of IP addresses. And, um, and then when you s sign up, now chances are uh, you're using a DHCP. So back in the early days of the internet, uh, when I signed up with a internet service provider, they actually gave me an IP address that never changed. So I was assigned an IP address uh, to use for all of my internet connections. Now they typically use what's called DHCP, which will uh, assign a arbitrary IP address and it could change from one day to the next. Uh, it's kind of generated randomly when you log in, you're assigned this random IP address. And then you have that one IP address and you're, let's say if you're connected with a cable modem, uh, your cable modem then uses that one IP address to talk to your internet service provider. But then how do you handle all of the different telephones and computers and whatever that you might have in your home that are also connected to the internet through this internet service provider. Well, your cable modem, your router in your cable modem would assign what are called private IP addresses. So we have public IP addresses that are like this 128 208 to 151. That's a public IP address that are assigned to people who are actually connected into the internet. But everything in your home goes into the router on your cable modem. And you're not assigned one of these global IP addresses. You're assigned what's called a private or a local IP address. And uh, and typically they go like uh, here. Let me let me show you. Let me pull up my uh, my network app my network application on my computer and show you here. So um, my computer is actually hooked up to my home internet in two different ways. It's hooked up with an Ethernet, which is this connection, and it's hooked up also with Wi-Fi, which is this connection. So uh, I could disconnect my Ethernet and then it would just be working over Wi-Fi. Now my router hooked up to my cable modem then assigns to everything in my home and assigns a private IP address. Now, all these private IP addresses for my home begin with 192. So I have 192, 168. And this is the way most of them begin. They, there is a, there's a block that begins with seven, or sorry, with 10, and there's a, another block. And I think I'll get to those in a minute. But most of the, most of your private IP addresses begin 192.168 um, at the uh, at UCA I I don't remember if they do 10 or they do 192 uh, or they you do something else uh, and uh, now notice here my IP address here that's assigned by my router for my Ethernet connection is 192.168.1 dash 117. Now, if I were to connect with my Wi-Fi, my router actually assigns me a different local IP address here. It's 192.168.189. So it, I actually have two different local IP addresses depending on whether 
um, communicating over Ethernet or communicating over Wi-Fi. Okay, now, there's also something else. That are, usually they're referred to, uh, if you talk to the IT people, they refer to them as MAC addresses. And um, uh, a MAC address is similar to an IP address and that every piece of hardware which would connect to the network has its own assigned, stays the same forever MAC address. It's assigned, it's, uh, it's assigned by a hardware card that is inserted in your laptop or whatever it else that you're using. It's, a, uh, it's fixed and never changes. It's assigned on manufacture. Your phone has a MAC address. Your computer has a MAC address. Uh, and your router has a MAC address. So it's assigned a permanent, never changing MAC address on manufacturing. Now, you might say, why do we need IP addresses if every piece of hardware connected to the internet has a unique address? And um, it's because uh, the internet connections typically are diverted geographically. It's uh, the internet connection is like your the address of your house. Uh, now, if you're at the address of your house, someone wants to send you a letter, they send it to that address. But if you move to UCA, it's still you, but you're at a different address now. So the, the IP address works like your home address uh, in that it identifies a location. And your name, if you identifies your MAC address, although there might be other people that have identically your name. Let's assume you're the only person with that name for now. So your name is like the MAC address and the IP address is like your mailing address. So you keep that name wherever you go. But if I want to send you a letter and I just write down your name and say, please send this letter to this person, then the, the, the postal company, the postal service, isn't going to know where you are. And they're not going to be able to get the letter to you because they don't know if you're, even if they did know where you lived, they, you may not be there. You may be at UCA. So putting your name down, which is like your MAC address, won't get you the letter. The IP address is specifically linked to UCA or it's specifically linked uh, to your internet service provider. So that's the difference between the IP address and the uh, um, IP address and the uh, MAC address. So now, as I said, the, uh, there aren't enough IP version for MAC addresses. And uh, so let's talk about this a little bit. Sir, sir can yeah. I ask you a question? Yeah. Uh, can uh, MAC addresses be the same for devices? Uh, no. OK. They're, they're unique to the device. No two devices should have the same MAC addresses. Now, if you notice that typically when you now, I don't know, hell, who knows, maybe that's changed recently. But um, uh, when you go in, and for example, you go into UCA and um, they give you a computer, they register your MAC address on their network. So their local network knows your MAC address. And they, the DHCP server assigns you a, a private IP address and it 
has also recorded your MAC address information. Now, it's quite possible that if you're communicating with other individuals at UCA, at UCA, that it may not even use uh, actively, may not even use the private IP address because the network is keeping track of where your computer with a specific MAC address is. Uh, sometimes a MAC address is called the Ethernet address. So you can locally at UCA on, at NARIN on the NARIN campus, you only need to know, let's say, the MAC address or the Ethernet address to talk between people. Um, so it may not even use that, that local IP address. Now, um, how are these um, blocks of IP addresses assigned to um, the uh, internet service providers? They're assigned using this prefix notation, which is what I want to try to describe right now. Now, the prefix defines a block of IP addresses. So let me, uh, let me tell you what the notation is, and then I'll give you some examples of it. So here on this page right here, we see, uh, see that diagram. Now, the IP address, as I've said, has 32 bits in it. Now, your um, internet service provider or uh, UCA or whatever has a block of addresses. And uh, the block of addresses are defined by the prefix. And the way that the prefix is written out is, uh, is indicated in this diagram right here. You see this, this diagram here, right here, this diagram, come on. Oh. This diagram right here. Okay, now, um, we will have a, a, a prefix that has L bits in it, L bits. And typically, the way the prefix is defined is like this. Let me jump ahead here now, just show you these. Okay. So here I have some examples of how prefixes are assigned. Let's look right here. We start off with uh, the top number there is 192.24.0.0, and then there's a slash 21. So if you remember, we have eight bits in each one of those four numbers. So now let me back up here. Okay, so this is, these are all the bits in an IP address shown right here. There's, should be 32 bits right across the bottom, right across here, in that number right here, 32 bits. And the way the addresses can be defined is we can we define a beginning number with these numbers, and we'll define that but L bits will be defined. So we will have a set of numbers, and it'll be L bits. And those are fixed, and the remaining bits, the 32 minus L, are what are the numbers that can vary. So the first L bits in the 32-bit IP address are fixed and assigned to the internet service provider. So the first L bits are fixed, and then the remaining 32 minus L bits can vary. So again, let me go back now to 
this example right here. So, for example, we have 192.24, or what happened there? Oh, I, oh, I hate it when that happens. Chapter two, I'm in chapter five. Chapter four, chapter five, network layer. To keep track, should have remembered what that page number was. Sir, may I ask one question before you go there? Yeah. So you can, what you about the, the yeah? What about the VPN? So it's only changing your IP address, right? Um, the the VPN. Um, is um, um, the VPN probably does something that's called tunneling. And uh, tunneling uh, is discussed in the, I think it's discussed in the very last lecture for this week. And, and you might want to look in the textbook for tunneling. Uh, what the, the VPN does is it um, uh, hides your IP address in, in, in that you log into the VPN and it um, assigns you an IP address uh, that's different than the one you're assigned by your internet service provider. And the people out on the internet see the IP address assigned by the VPN. And so it changes your IP address. Um, that's not as uh, sort of the solution that it was at one time, because now uh, a lot of places actually have lists. I mean, the, the VPN providers, um, they have a block of IP addresses also. And so it's not like uh, you're using a VPN, you're using a completely random IP address. You're not. You have to be using an IP address that was assigned to the provider of the VPN. And so now a lot of places just keep a list of all the IP addresses that the VPN companies use. So they know you know you're using a VPN. And so what I found is is odd things will happen. I use I, I had a VPN when I was um, there in Kyrgyzstan, and uh, if I was using the VPN, I might log into some websites, and they wouldn't even let me log in because they had they knew that I was using a VPN, so they they just wouldn't even let me in. Whereas if I stopped using the VPN and, and just used the IP address that was assigned by UCA, it would let me in. So using a VPN doesn't always save you in the way you think it does. And um, so it, it does it. The VPN hides your IP address. And it typically does that using something called tunneling. And that's described a bit in the textbook if you want to go and look at look for tunneling and see what it does. OK, now let me go back to this right here. OK, this thing. So what's going on? Notice this first number here is 194.24.0.0 and then there's slash 21. So what that means is the first 21 bits are fixed. They they are, um, let's say, assigned to um, the internet service provider. So the first address, and uh, I don't. These may be actually the actual addresses. K 
Cambridge University, according to this, um, is assigned the, uh, might be the computer science department in Cambridge, is assigned uh, 194.24.0.0. And it's assigned all the IP addresses from this very first one right here, all the way up to this one right here. So there's a whole block of IP addresses. So the first IP address is 194.24.0.0. Now, if you actually now count up, From that, so the next IP address would be 194.24.0.1. The next IP address would be 194.24.0.2. And then that would go all the way up to 255. And then after this is at 255, the next one would have a one in the in where the second, so this might this will go all the way up to 255 and then after that it goes back to zero and then a one goes here so you have a one here and then you go from zero back up to 255 so you go through all of the first not 21 bits but 32 minus 21 minus 21 is 11 so there are the last 11 bits in this IP address are random, can be assigned to anyone connected there at Cambridge University. And there are a total of 248 different IP addresses, starting with the lowest one, which is this one, and then going all the way up to the highest one, which is this one right here, okay, this one, the one with, uh, 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 no, that's not right. So going all the way up to this one right here, this is the, uh, uh, come on. So this would be the last address. So we have the first address here, the last address. It, it takes a total of 11 bits to define all of those addresses. And um, so this is the way, this is called a prefix, this notation, and that if we write 194.24.0.0 slash 21, the lowest address is given here, and then we take not the next 21, but the next 11, 32 minus 21, the, the lowest 11 bits in this number are then can be randomly assigned to people at Cambridge. Now, let's say at Edinburgh, we have 194.24.8.0. So this would be the lowest IP address at Edinburgh. And the, the bottom there, so the first 22 bits in that IP address, the highest 22 bits are fixed. And then 32 minus 22 is 10. So the lowest 10 bits can then be passed out to people at Edinburgh. At Oxford, here. Oxford, let's say we start off with 194.24.16, and we say, okay, the first, the highest 20 bits are fixed, which are def defined by this number, and then the 20 minus 32 is 12, so we use the bottom 12 bits are then handed out to users to use on their computers and their items that are connected to the internet. So this is how IP prefixes are defined and assigned. So these groups of prefixes are assigned out 
to all the users. So all the users at Cambridge get numbers in this range. All the users at Edinburgh get numbers in this range and so on. OK, so that's how the prefixes are defined. Then when we. We get a number, let's say, from the prefix from our IP service provider, and that's assigned to us as a user. Then in our home, the the router in our home then assigns private IP addresses individually to all the devices in our home that need to be connected to the Internet. And it, typically it uses port numbers to assign those IP addresses to our uh, to to different devices in our home. But when our devices connect out over the Internet, they all appear to have that same IP address that our Internet service provider has has given to us. So everything coming out of our home going out over the Internet appears to have the same IP address. And the router it keeps track of the the router adds something onto the header on the IP packet send in, that it sends out. So it, the internet only sees that one IP address, and it's only in the IP packet that's sent out. In the header are assigned port numbers. So when that when somebody's trying to communicate with our specific cell phone or our specific laptop in our home. It comes in with the IP address that we all have, but then within the packet, there is a port number and that port number tells the router. Exactly which device in our home. That packet should be sent to. So that that whole elaborate procedure where we only get one IP address and then the router divides up all that one IP address into these local private IP addresses. That whole process saved the Internet from being overloaded because back in the beginning, every device that we would have in our home would have a separate Internet IP address. But as we begin running out of IP addresses, this. This workaround of private IP addresses was developed, so. It's uh, it's, it's actually worked amazingly well. Now that isn't necessary now if we use IP version six. And uh, let me show you IP version six and what that looks like. OK, here again is my computer's. Internal network data. So let me go to my. Ethernet here. So you see down at the bottom, there's this number. This is my IP version six address. And um, now IP version six. And you see we have oh, a whole bunch of numbers here. How many of them are there? Well, there's one number here, two, three. Four, five. Six. We have all of these numbers here. And notice up here. Um, that how many more numbers there are here than there are in the normal IP address. OK, so. Now IP version six, this is discussed in one of our uh, in 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 one of the one of the videos. Let's see if they discuss it here 
I don't think they do, not right here. No, they don't. Now, IP version 6 is given much, much larger uh, numbers, where IP version 4 and 8 bit numbers, IP version 6, the numbers are in hexadecimal. Each one of these numbers right here, like uh, set 1700, each one of those digits is a hexadecimal digit. And uh, here you can see we have 1D20. So you can clearly see this is a hexadecimal number, where here the digit is D. OK, so here, here's a hexadecimal number. We have 149B. Here the digit is B. And uh, like I said, I think there are something like uh, 2 to the to the oh how two to the hundred and twenty eight there's there, you know, uh, there's so many different IP version six numbers I don't think there's a word for how big that number is and um, so it's possible that every device in your home could be assigned a separate IP version six address and um, some providers might be using IP version 6. Now, many of them might be. Uh, a few years ago, they actually ran a test case where everyone, every internet service provider who was ready actually ran IP version 6 for a day, and I think it went pretty well. So some internet service providers might be assigning IP version 6 uh, right now and using it. And th that adds a, a difficulty uh, to the internet because some internet service providers are still using IP version 4, some are using IP version 6. So we have a problem that's created by that in that if we have a user, let me draw a picture here. here say here's a user. Um, and you're connected to a provider that transmits from here to here over IP version 6. But then as you're routed over the internet, there's one section of the route goes from here to here that uses IP version 4. Okay, and then there might be another section, IP version 6. So, and these are not compatible with one another. In other words, an IP version 6 address is not recognized by an IP version 4 uh, link in the internet. So what happens is when it gets right here is that at this point, it may be, this may, this may have been, uh, Maybe a little bit different now than what uh, than what they're actually doing, but what they would do is when they would send out a packet. So they'll send out a packet, an IP version four packet. Now let me make a note here: is that the length of the packet is not limited to 32 bits. Only the address is limited to 32 bits. The packets can be arbitrarily large. So um, that's a potential point of confusion when we talk about IP version 4 having 32-bit addresses. That's not saying that the packet sizes are limited to 32 bits. Now, the, the packet has to contain the address of the, tr of the sender and the address of the receiver in it, but the packet can be large. It can have many kilobits in it. So what what they do is we're sending packets over an IP version 6 link. They get here 
and they have to go over an IP version 4 link. Now what happens is the IP version 6 information is then stored in the packet right here. So when this and so this will be an IP version 4 packet that contains let's say right in here the version 6 information. So when this packet gets here, this router reads the packet and pulls off the IP version 6 information and then uses that to continue to send the packet on to the person who's supposed to receive the packet. And in some sense, that's how VPNs work. And that the VPN actually has to have your real IP address to communicate with you. It has to know the IP address that your internet service provider has assigned you. But let you go from your internet service provider to the VPN server. They then store your real IP address in the packet. And then the packets are sent from the VPN server using another IP address and they're sent out. So everybody now communicating with you communicates with the VPN server. The VPN server takes those packets and then resends that information to you locally. Okay, so it has to, it works something like that. That's not quite right, but but this whole process is called tunneling. So this right here, a tunnel is set up where the IPv6 information tunnels through the IPv4 link by storing it in the IPv4 packet. And then it's pulled out of the packet right here and then sent on. And as I've said in previous lectures, it's amazing that all this stuff works because this all has to happen real time. You know, millions upon millions upon millions of times, uh, every time you connect to the internet, you're downloading a video. I mean, all of this has to happen in real time. Uh, and um, so it's, it's amazing that it works at all. Okay, so I just wanted to talk a little bit about these IP prefixes. I wanted to talk a little bit about the public versus private IP addresses. So the private IP addresses are just used locally on your local network and, and um, don't have anything to do with what people see out on the internet. They only see your public IP address, not your private IP address. And uh, then there's IP version 6, which is what we're moving over to now. Maybe most, um, most networks on the internet, maybe they're transferred over to IP version 6 now. Um, I, uh, I don't know how many are and how many are still using IP version 4. So, um, Sir, can I ask yeah. a question? Yeah. What's the advantage of using IP version 6 than IP version 4? Say this again, what's your question? What's the advantage of using IP version 6 that you, you mentioned that most of the companies are changing to use? Well, they, there version aren't version enough, version. there aren't enough IP addresses. IP version four. We we've used okay. them all up, and and um, so this idea of using um, local IP addresses as a workaround to get us through the problem of not having enough IP addresses. Uh, ideally, every device in your home that's connected to the internet should should have its own IP address. Think about if you're trying to serve 
uh, information off your computer at home. So let's say uh, you you were illegally allowing people to download songs and videos off your computer. Uh, you would have to have a fixed IP address because DACP, your IP address can change. So if somebody wants to get on your computer and download a video and uh, your IP address changes, then they cannot download the video. That was, uh, uh, that was, I mean, I ran into that problem early on, you know, in the early days of the internet. Um, I actually, you know, ran um, uh, web servers and everything off of my computer at home and in fact, I had a web server and I wanted that web server to have a fixed IP address so that people anywhere in the world could type in that IP address and connect to my web server computer. And if the DACP from day to day would change my IP address, then people couldn't couldn't do that. They couldn't always connect with my computer because my IP address would change. So the IP version six, in theory, and I don't know if they're all doing this or not, but in theory, every device in your home, anywhere, every device anywhere can have a fixed permanent IP address, which is the internet address. It's the address used to communicate over the internet. So the advantage is you can have a fixed IP address that never changes. So, um, so any other Thank questions? Thank you, sir. Yeah, uh, do you, does that, is that clear? Or, read over the book, uh, look at the videos. I think there are like six videos for this week. And uh, some of the videos you may have to view more than once. I think maybe the first time I looked at them, I thought they were a bit confusing, some of them anyway. And uh, so you look at the videos, he explains this, but then the book explains them in more detail. Um, now I have um, made a few changes here here is my computer network syllabus that I put on Moodle. And I've added a few things onto this uh, and uploaded the, the uh, changed version of the document today. Um, so in uh, the videos for this week, uh, they're all videos marked with four because I think in an earlier version of the book, all of this was handled in chapter four, but in the version of the book that um, I have uh, posted, um, some of these are in chapter five. So a lot of this network stuff is now in chapter five. Um, so <coughs> here in this video right here, he talks about IP version six. And um, uh, you should look at all these videos here because like uh, they're starting to get a little bit more complicated now. And in some of these videos, like I said, you might have to look at a couple of times before you fully understand everything in the video. So first look at the videos and then look at the sections in the book that discuss these topics. And um, so I'm just looking down here. I guess we only have about a month left in the course. So uh, I'm, uh, I'm going to be working on a, a sample final exam maybe in the next week. 
I will post the sample final exam so you can look at that and look at those questions also. And uh, so you know what to expect on the final exam. Um, any other questions there? Let me come back here. So, um, we have about six of you on there right now, seven, seven of you. And uh, so I hope the other people are looking at the, the video recording of the lesson after the fact. And uh, so IP addresses, like everything else, it's more complicated than you think it is when you uh, originally, uh, originally see it. Uh, the IP addresses are more complicated. Uh, the relationship between IP addresses and MAC addresses is um, uh, is an area of that's potentially confusing. Every device has a unique MAC address, um, and that MAC address stays with the device. But as you move around, your IP address changes. The IP address is linked to a specific location, and the MAC address is linked to a specific device. And it's kind of like the difference between your name in your house address. Um, so um, I haven't seen anyone sending me um, any email questions, so I assume you're man managing to get your questions worked out. Um, how are your other courses going? So far, good. So far, so good? Yeah. How are you doing your hardware? Like Masood had hardware courses. How are you doing the hardware? Uh, we are doing only theoretical parts right now. OK. Um, there are some hardware simulators yeah. online, but he's not using that? No. no. OK. How about your other courses? How's image processing? We are given pr projects and we have just like your course or one session per week. And on the other session, we are just working in groups. OK, now I've um, I talked to Ben Knoll um, earlier. Uh, we uh, Sohel Ashrafi and I had a, a half hour conversation with them and um, Right now, what we're thinking about trying to do is um, you know, people who might be interested in, in doing a uh, uh, senior project on gaming. Um, I think it would be good uh, for people to try to look at the one of the two gaming engines there's unreal and uh what was the what was the other one there's Un unity unity, unity. Right. and um because i think you know i'm thinking that with the gaming project we we i want to have perhaps a s group of people working on a single game you know not one person on a project, although you could do that. Uh, when video games are actually developed, they're done in small groups. And and people in the groups tend to specialize in one thing or another. And uh, one of the things that um, uh, if you were going to apply to enter the graduate program in gaming, at University of Central Florida, which is where Ben Knoll uh, was, is the founding director of that program. And I told you it's it's right now it's ranked uh, the number one program in the United States. If you 
thought you might want to go to graduate school at University of Central Florida in gaming. Uh, what we want to try to do is get it so that perhaps those of you who might be interested in doing that could get accepted into that program. And uh, it would really, I think, assist you in getting accepted if you took some time to learn one of these gaming engines. Um, uh, ben, I, I think I mentioned this to you before, but Ben Knoll said that Unity is in fact used by some of the gaming companies. Now, um, Electronic Hearts has developed their own uh, gaming engine. But um, if you know how to use a gaming engine, so if you went into graduate school, you would almost surely be using these gaming engines to develop whatever games you would develop in graduate school. And most of what you do in the graduate program is working on group projects. So they, they would really be happy to see that you have some experience working in a group. And so what Sohail Ashrafi and I were ta thinking about is maybe we could have a group that might involve a couple of CS students and maybe even a couple of comms and media students. And the idea would be, in my mind anyway, is you would begin working on a really simple game, really simple game. Like I mentioned, a tank battle game or something like that, where all of your graphics are two dimensional. You know, a tank is a rectangle with a line sticking out of it for the gun. So you, your graphics are really simple. And uh, so you don't need to have any accomplished 3D artist. So you do a, you begin by doing a very simple game. And, um, and then uh, you get a simple game working and then you decide to add something like perhaps add uh, third dimension levels and you know so it's your the world in which you're operating is no longer simply two dimension maybe it's three dimensional and then you have to do three dimensional graphics and and uh, so the idea being start out with something simple and then build it up slowly and make it more complicated as different people in the group um, have different skills for example not everybody can do three-dimensional art. In fact, it appears from what Ben Knoll said that good three-dimensional artists earn more money than the computer programmers because there are fewer of them who are good at it. And uh, so I'm thinking we get a group uh, to work on a game with a couple of computer science people, uh, a comms and media person, who might work on the story for the game, uh, might work, there might be somebody to help do the artwork, the computer people work with the gaming engine and whatever other programming is required. So we start with a simple game and build it up and make it more and more complicated. So that way, even if you only have a simple game finished by the end of the year, you have something that you can show. Uh, it doesn't have to be it doesn't have to be the latest version of Doom, right? It can be something simple. Uh, but we start with something simple and build up and make it more complicated. So uh, that's what is in my mind. And I described, and Sohail Ashrafi and I talked about a little bit, and I think he might be thinking along the same lines. And none of us has ever done this before. Uh, none of us have done your senior projects. None of us have really made a video game. The only video game I ever made was like a Pong game years ago using uh, the processing programming language. Uh, the Pong game would be even simpler than a tank battle game, but if I could do it back then, I figure 
you know, one of you guys could do a tank battle game is um, I'm sure you're better programmers than I am. I've never viewed myself as being a, a great programmer. And uh, so this is what I'm thinking about. So uh, if you think you might want to go this route, our plan is to try to, if you're interested in graduate school, to get you into graduate school at University of Central Florida. And of course, the advantage there is you get to come and visit the United States for a year or year and a half or whatever. But also, since I'm already here, you, you know somebody here. I mean, even the comms and media people know me, right? So you would know somebody here. So you would come here, but you'd have somebody you could go to if you ran into some problems. That would be me. And uh, so that's what's in my mind uh, for doing this gaming. So if you're interested in giving it a shot, trying to make this work, you might want to start looking at these gaming engines and looking at the tutorials uh, and trying to learn how to do the gaming engines. And uh, does this make sense? Anybody have any questions? Okay. Yeah. Uh, will there be a specific language to write it or, or any skills needed? Um, I think, um, I mean, Ben Noel mentioned that with one of those, you can even do programming in Python, which you all should know. Um, I'm also told that um, C Sharp is a language that might be used in Unity, uh, but I, I think there's a possibility that you can do programming in one of a couple of different programming languages and my son tells me you can actually you can make a video game without doing any programming at all in these gaming engines now it may not be you know a super fancy i mean to do something really sophisticated you have to you have to write some programs but the gaming engine is the um gives you the environment in which you can assemble a video game without doing any programming from what I'm told. So that's another reason to look at the gaming engines, right? Um, so um, it's a, it's, don't be intimidated because you haven't done it before. As I um, I was talking with uh, Sohail Shrafi, and he was worried about the comms and media students not having not having a background uh, for doing this. And I told him, and it's absolutely true. I, I've never had the background to do anything that I've ever done. You know, whenever I do something that ends up being really worthwhile, I went into it without having a sufficient background. So I learn what I need to learn while I'm doing it. And I've talked about this before. That's a skill that you need to develop. So my suggestion is right now, look at some of these gaming engines, pick one and, um, and try to learn how to do it. And uh, look at whatever tutorials there are online and start to learn it. And uh, if it if it goes where I hope it goes, uh, it could get you into a graduate program uh, here in Florida. Hopefully the virus is all gone by then. So there you have the Russian vaccine there, so you be protected. Okay, guys. I've been talking for an hour. I'm uh, turning into a zombie any minute now. So uh, I'll talk to you all next week. Uh, if you have any questions, send me an email. We can uh, 
chat online if it's necessary. Uh, look at the videos and uh, look at the questions I have associated with the videos. And you might want to look at the sections in the book to get uh, more detailed information. OK, then I'll see everybody. Take care. See you, sir. Goodbye. See you, sir. Bye.